Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, we are here to um, conduct interviews for our new police chief, and the person being interviewed right now is um, Interim Chief Dave Hale. Um, council has just spent about 45 minutes asking questions, and so we want to hear from the community. Um, I'll just start taking show of hands, and, and I can write down names if I hear, you know, as people are raising their hands. So. Who wants to go first? <laughs> oh, <laughs> good. <laughs> and so come up to the to the microphone, state your name, and uh, each you'll have three minutes. I, I, I guess if you're just asking questions, it shouldn't take that long. So. Okay. My name is Robert Harris, and I live on Miami Drive, 175 Miami Drive, and I've been in Yellow Springs for about 52 years. I've raised four ch three children. They've all gone to college and. Uh, the village has really changed in that those 52 years. But I'm kind of curious, um, one of my close friends many years ago was a Jim McKee. I don't know if you... I'm, I'm aware of him, yes. To yes. You or not. Anyhow, he was police chief in Yellow Springs for over 30 years. And um, his, I think he was one of the developers of community policing. And he felt that he should the, the ideal objective was to keep people out of jail. Now, unfortunately, he was followed by another police chief who felt just the opposite. He felt that anyone who did a crime could be uh, told, uh, how can I say it, incarcerated, and it would prevent them from repeating, you know, criminal activities. And I'd like to know, what is your philosophy of policing? I mean, do you have a philosophy of, you know, <coughs> uh, incarceration as a rehabilitative, rehabilitative uh, experience? Or is it just, you know, something that uh, has no merit? Um, Thank you, Mr. Harris. Thank you. I'll just sit down. No, no. The <clears throat> 50 years, a lot of things have changed. And, and one of those things that have changed is attorneys and lawsuits. And we've become a very litigious society. Um, clearly, when there is a victim to crimes, that victim has a say. If you, you know, if you assault your neighbor and the neighbor wants to press charges, my hands are sort of tied and we will pursue with charges. Are there a lot of things where are victimless crimes? Yes, yes there are. And um, I do believe that we need to get back to um, what is known as community policing. I, I believe, and, and we've been discussing it here earlier, what police officers have done over the course of time is to sort of get this factory worker mentality that you're here for eight hours and I want to see productivity. I want to see stuff. And it causes officers to feel like they need to go out, they need to make traffic stops because they feel this is deterring crime. I don't think statistically you can show that that has really deterred crime. I think what it has done is alienated a bunch of people and make people believe every time they see that the lights in them, that, that, that oh crap factor that everybody feels when they see them in the rearview mirror. Um, I believe that getting out into community, that especially a community of this size, getting to know people, being seen, getting to know the neighbors, and communicating people will, getting people involved and sort of paying attention to their neighbors will have a much greater effect on deterring crime than being a, a proactive police department that is stopping everything that moves. Um, as far as incarceration and rehabilitation, Yes and no. Um, I, you know, number one, to some degree, that is the judge's realms more than the police officers. My, my, my job to judge. Um, I believe certain people, much like children, you know, you warn them so often at some point, maybe they need to be disciplined. Um, in some degree, that may be what incarceration is. But I don't believe that you incarcerate people for the hopes of them rehabilitating because statistically it just doesn't really hold up. Um, you know, you go through and look at any 12 help step program, 
you can't help people till they want help. And part of the court's problems, in my mind, is we try to help people because they become expert manipulators and we send them to all these programs and we spend a lot of government dollars when all they really want to do is not go to prison. You help people when they're ready to get help, when they hit rock bottom and they need to be the social services and the networks for them to get that help because that's when it's effective. Does that answer most of your questions, Robert? Well, it always I, generates new questions. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe you'll have an, an opportunity. Kate? Hi, I'm Kate Hamilton. Um, I know that you were at the community forum that HRC funded, or not funded, sponsored, and I appreciate that you're there. I think that was great. Um, there was a lot of talk about what our town wants in the next chief, and uh, a, a theme that I saw was uh, restorative justice. I think we need to be careful when we say community policing because community policing doesn't mean what I think a lot of us think it means. Restorative justice is uh, de-escalation rather than escalation, uh, peace officers versus military style, um, crisis intervention, that type of thing. And I've noticed from your resume and the interview with the newspaper that you don't have a broad background in those areas and this is something that's important to our village. So uh, I was also at the peace um, gathering last night at the church and you were there which was great that took a lot of uh, guts to be there and to stand up and and present yourself and I really appreciated that that showed a lot of strength um, and <coughs> It seemed from what you said there that you're willing to learn a different style of policing, perhaps. Um, and I just wanted to ask you if you are, and if you are, do you have a clear plan on how to do that, since it is something different from your style? And if you are to do something a little bit different, do you have specific organizations in mind, tools, mentors, and do you have a plan? And if you have a plan, and this is like a lot of if and. You, you've covered a lot of ground, yes. <laughs> if you have a plan for yourself, then what would be your plan to implement that to your officers? Okay. That's really long, sorry. Thanks, Kate. <laughs> um, for those of you not there last night, one of the things that we <coughs> talked about was, was training uh, of the police. And in looking back over what I've seen, um, you know, years ago, uh, before the internet was very popular and before you saw police officers um, grabbing individuals, shooting individuals, police officers were watching in-car videos of officers being shot. And the reaction to that was scenario-based training to show officers how to handle these things. And I believe inadvertently what has sort of happened is over the course of time what we have created is a red light, green light situation for training. You walk into a room and um, there's, there's a, a car there and the trunk is open and you know there's a guy on the other side of the trunk and you can't see him and he has a felony warrant. And they tell you to go in and handle it. Well, he's got a felony so your gun's halfway drawn at your side however you wish to handle it and you're going to tell this ind individual to step out from the rear of the car. That individual is going to step out. He's either going to have probably a cell phone in his hand or he's going to have a gun in his hand pointed at you. And what it has inadvertently done is created a, a shoot, don't shoot mentality for police officers. You do as you're trained. And I don't believe law enforcement intended it, but I think looking back at it, that is what we've sort of done. And, and you're seeing it in full play on national news. Um, and, and that has to be changed. Is there a lot of resources for that? No, not right now. Um, well, one of the things that I cited was statistics, and I grabbed um, the number of officers in a department, metro departments, uh, divide it by the number of shootings they have had, and it comes out to most departments are anywhere from 150 to 300 officers annually will have one officer involved in, in a shooting. NYPD, that has close to 35,000 officers, used to have about 110 to 1 ratio. They have reduced that to 2,318, 2,312 to 1. So how do they do that? 
and I'm, I, I don't have those answers. Uh, you know, I am looking, I am sort of new to the police executive end of this. I've always sort of followed policy. Someone else has always said it. Um, but I'm willing to go in and look. I know that OPADA, which is the Ohio Peace Officers Training Academy, is scrambling to, to look at new ideas and get things done. Um, you know, it, 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 and, and I said it last night, most people need, feel there needs to be a police department. Everybody wants that degree of order in their community. And police officers never please 100% of the people, and we're sort of used to that. But when there is a significant number of that community that are unhappy with it, it becomes oppression. And cops don't want to be oppressors. It's not what we want to do. We want to be peace officers. Um, and we need to get back to those things. And I think that that is one of, one of the steps in doing it. I think it is a very, very complex issue. You ask a lot of questions. You know, one of the questions always comes up is minority hiring. Well, um, it's Dayton Daily News last Sunday. Dayton PD has spent a half million dollars on minority hiring, and I think the paper said it changed the needle zero. Why? Because of the image that police officers have. So all these things have to be fixed, but I believe that if you can fix this mentality that, that people are afraid when the cop is behind them, suddenly young black men, women growing up aren't afraid of the cops, they're not afraid then to become a cop. And I think this will correct a lot of the problems. But it is a very, very complex issue. Um, am I willing to, you know, reach out to APADA to share my thoughts? Yes. Um, do we have anything right now that I know of that I can reach out and contract with and send my people to? Well, there's, there's CIT training. There's those things, and they are clearly helpful. But the, the whole red light, green light shooting scenario I think is new ground. Um, we can train our own people to some degree. We have certified trainers. You know, we can start sort of instead of getting that scenario where the guy walks out of the trunk, okay, what do you do? What are your other options? What can you do in, in this situation? Why would you not consider this? Um, you know, let's start dealing with those, get officers thinking more instead of just following the shoot, don't shoot protocol. Um, and I know uh, as far as restorative justice, again, to some degree, <coughs> that is a division of the courts. Justice is, is for the judiciary, not for the cops. But again, I don't, I'm not hard pressed on these misdemeanors where there's no violence, no victim. Um, do I think we need to send a 19 year old to jail? No, no. And I think that's one of the things we have the mayor's court, I think is a great tool to use. I think it is uh, a lot more representative than of this community. And if it quits being so, then the community has the say to shut it down if they need be. Does that, did I touch on a lot of your points, hopefully? I don't know about all of them, but. Thanks, Dave. Um, I don't know why I'm going blank on your name. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> no. Joe, yes. <clears throat> My name is Joe Lewis. <coughs> I was on council for several years in the 90s, and during that time we had three police, three police chiefs. Jim McKee retired, we had Wiley Sampson, and Jim Miller. And I was fortunate enough to sit in on the interviews. We had the Ohio Police Chiefs Association, I think, set up a panel and re-interviewed for the day. We learned a lot about the officers. I have seen your name, but I don't know you. I don't know what your background is or anything. I, it would be good, I think, if you could tell us what your background is with the type of uh, police departments you've uh, worked for, what your administrative uh, experiences are, what your, the most critical event that you've had during the, your police uh, uh, time, and all of those things. Uh, I think that I found that during that period of time that uh, we didn't have too many critical police issues or one or two, but administration has always been a problem, whether it's budgeting and funding, um, uh, working with your officers, uh, pr promotions, setting a, a, a standard for performance, all of those things. I'd just like to know what your experience is with that with regard to overall policing. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um, I started, I've been with uh, two police departments now, this one 
in the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office. I started there December 26th of 1984. I actually came in Christmas night um, because I started on midnight. I worked uh, 27 months as a civilian in the dispatch center. I went for about two years as a corrections officer in the jail, approximately a year then as a deputy sheriff in the courts. Um, I, there was a year I did transportation, which was a uh, taking inmates from the jail either to prison or hospitals, dental appointments, etc. cetera. Um, I ended up going and worked mainly midnights, uh, North Dixie, Main Street, Salem Avenue area. Um, worked with um, Sheriff Plummer. He and I were predominantly ran that beat together for about two years. Um, I did that until 90, summer of 90, 95, 94. Um, I did a short stint as the uh, interim detective over the summer, predominantly covered. I did the shirt and tie detective thing, um, w covered vacations and et cetera, which um, burglaries, uh, property crimes, missing juveniles, that kind of stuff. Went back to the street for a short period and then entered the drug unit doing uh, undercover and drug work from 95 until the end of 2000. Uh, nine months of that was spent with the Ohio Organized Crime Investigation Commission, which is the uh, Attorney General's specialized task force. Uh, we were doing organized crime figures, um, investigations. 2000, into 2000, I got promoted, uh, became a sergeant, rotate back through the jail for about two and a half years, supervised dispatch for a year, went back to the streets on midnights for a year in Washington Township, supervised the drug unit for two years, got moved over and supervised the violent crimes unit for the sheriff's office, which handled the rapes, the homicides, uh, abductions, bank robberies, shootings, violent crimes for about two plus years. Um, promoted to captain and ran the district headquarters in Jefferson Township um, for a year, got promoted to major ran operations which meant I oversaw all the, sort of the police functions. The sheriff's office has uh, the personnel function, the jail function, and the patrol function. Operations and patrol functions. I oversaw 108 people. Uh, the last year and a half of my career I got moved to personnel where I dealt with uh, contracts. We actually negotiated three contracts with the three unions for the sheriff's office. Personnel issues, discipline, <coughs> hiring, firing, workers' comp, FMLA, all that sort of fun stuff. Um, so I've had, I've been on sometimes two and three sides of the fence. Um, at one point, I actually, as an administrator, saw the dispatch center for six months also. So I've been on the dispatching side of it, the supervising side of it, the administrative side of patrol, um, and dispatch and the supervisor and worker side of the jail. Um, probably my most critical incident um, early on, I was actually a very, very new officer. Uh, we had a situation, a guy held up inside a house with a gun. He eventually came out of the back of the house with a rifle. Um, I looked at the guy to my right, had it sort of John Wayne style across his hip. Uh, I stuck my head up a little bit and said, Donnie, drop the gun. He looked at me, said, Donnie, drop the gun now. He shouldered the rifle and popped a round off at me. I shot back. I was a better shot than him, and he died. Um, the other probably critical thing, uh, if you recall the papers in 09, January 2nd of 09, um, Montgomery County Sheriff's Office had a homicide at 80 Redder where the four-year-old child was dropped off up here at the rest stop in London. Uh, that was my investigation. Uh, I was the sergeant over top of the detective section at the time. Um, that, that was something. Uh, I'd had some very good detectives throw that together. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I still, a, a true, true shame. Uh, that woman did nothing wrong. Um, so those are probably the two things that stick out in my mind as uh, 
as uh, the most interesting, maybe critical events. I've been written a lot of search warrants. I've kicked in doors, um, been where people are shooting rounds over my head a couple different times. So does that, that answer a lot of that? A lot of it, yes. Okay. And that is the gentleman on the aisle, and then I'll, the, the other gentleman. And come, yeah, come up and, and state your name to the microphone so we can hear you. And I'm sorry, I don't know your name. My name is Bill Randolph. I'm the uh, pastor of First Baptist Church here in town. Yes, sir. And uh, a couple of things. One that I'm interested in, in, I heard you say something about how Dayton and the minority hiring, and uh, I was wondering uh, what your thoughts are towards that and what your plans may be. Also, in regard to uh, some of the incidents that we've seen uh, across the country, I, I think you may have touched on that. Uh, regarding making sure that officers become uh, a little more uh, sensitive, if you will, uh, and, and what, what they do. Uh, years ago, I used to uh, work with Chief McKee from time to time. He would uh, call me and ask me to go visit some people who were having some challenges, mm -hmm. I would say, and uh, they, I was like the last step. And, uh, if he had to come back again, then they were, they were going to jail. And I was wondering if that's something that you also would be uh, look at doing with uh, some of the person, people here in the community, some of the other ministers, not, not just myself. Thanks, Mr. Randolph. Um, and I apologize if it's repeat for some of you. That, the minority hiring, if you read Dayton Daily's News paper mm -hmm. Sunday, um, it indicated they had spent a half million dollars over the last year and had moved the needle zero. Um, and they actually interviewed a guy named, uh, last name was Bush, I think Namron Bush, if I read it correctly. And he was one of the black students going through the academy. And, yeah, and he explained his reason for doing it, but they also interviewed other people who were like, you know, my friends, you know, that's not cool with my friends. And I, I believe it's a very, very involved issue. It's not as simple as going out and going to the schools because these places have been going to the schools. I've went with Sheriff Plummer numerous places and outreaches, and it doesn't seem to change things. Um, I believe it is an image. It is a problem. Um, and I think it all goes back to just how the police are, are perceived. And I believe police are in a bad light right now because we've gotten to a training issue where We've created a sort of this shoot, don't shoot, black and white, cut and dry thing instead of operating in the shades of gray and not examining our options. Um, I believe we've gotten into a, a position where administrators have caused their officers to believe that they've got to generate statistics, that we're become this factory work thing where they've got to have numbers. And so therefore, they're going out and stopping everything they can and, and in doing so are making people paranoid. And when you're paranoid, do you want to grow up and then become part of that organization? You don't want to be part of what you think is the problem. And a good portion of young black America sees law enforcement as the problem. The way to correct that is to correct law enforcement so it's no longer perceived as the problem. And I think if that happens, and it's a big big challenge don't I'm not trying to act like I can you know six months I have that cured I may not have the ability to, to make any effect on it but I think law enforcement has to realize that you know th this isn't this isn't the fringe one-tenth of one percent out there who thinks that you know we there should be no cops there is a significant number of people in any given community who are mistrusting the police and when that mistrust is there, the only way to, to change it is you've got to change the function and what the police are doing. And do I believe that maybe doing what Jim McKee was doing can correct that? Yeah, I think, I think that is part of it. I think people have to not fear the police so much because we've gotten into this sort of very cut and dry, this is what you do, this is what we, we've done. Part of that reason, Again, it goes back to this whole litigious society and lawyers 
and afraid of being sued and if you do this and you go into this house and they're they're using some drugs and you're aware of it and you don't do something and someone overdoses and dies what's the liability back on the police department and the political entity that runs that police department and that's one of I mean it's a very very complex issue uh, but I, I believe I understand where Jim McKee was and I'd love to get back there I'm not sure with attorneys and everything right now that we can get to that. I apologize, Brian, who's an attorney. Um, but, but again, it, it's, it is a different world, and, and it, the factors are different. Yes, sir. Henry Myers, Whitehall Drive. Um, I'd be interested in, in what you perceive your uniform would be if you became chief, and uh, what rank you would uh, assume, I guess assume, if you, uh, for maybe uh, formal occasions. Uh, yeah, I would keep the exact same uniform they have. I'm not so sure I like the patch all that much, but I'm not that particular on that kind of things. I'm, I'm not familiar with what it looks like. I mean. It, it's predominantly a, a, a sort of a navy blue on navy blue. Um, the officers normally do not wear a tie, although they do for formal occasions. Um, the patch is actually, um, it says Ohio, but you really have to sort of look at it to understand what it says. But I, I don't, it, it, there's cost in changing uniforms, so I would not. Uh, personally, I would wear the uniform, but probably not every day of the week. Um, I think there's times to sort of um, wear a tie, which is sort of unusual for me. I'm normally not in this bright of a purple, but I thought maybe it was a good option today. Um, I'm much more of a sweater guy, if, if you know. Um, and but I do think the troops need to every now and then see you in uniform, and I think people need to see you in uniform. Um, I think if I'm going to go out and and go to the schools. I think that's what the kids need to see. They need to recognize me as the chief of police and not some gray-haired guy uh, with a sweater. So I don't foresee myself wearing it daily, um, but I also do foresee myself wearing it at times. And the rank would be chief. There is no, you, we have, uh, you have a chief, we have two sergeants, and the rest are patrol officers. There are no captains or majors or lieutenants uh, here. Does that help? Yes, yes. Now, at times there's been rank, is why I asked the um, question. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I believe at some point, uh, I think Grody actually made captain at some point. Well, no, uh, well, okay. No, you answered it very good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Next, Sue. <coughs> I'm Sue Abendroth. Uh, it's my impression that Yellow Springs has always been of two worlds. We've had our small, close-knit, uh, almost incestuous community, and then we have Facebook and the internet and lots of travel and metropolitan areas close by. And it seems to me that we, that we are asking our peace officers to straddle both worlds because we can't protect ourselves com from the outside world and some of the influences that can damage a community that come in from the outside world. And we can't be so self-satisfied that we don't want to um, <coughs> have any interactions with the outside world. So I guess my question is, if you could speak a little bit to how you see having a foot in both camps, both as a person of the world and, and being knowledgeable about the region and the greater area <coughs> and the problems and issues that everyone faces and the particular Yellow Springs focus. Does that make sense as a question? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, I believe, um, number one, and, and I've said it from the day one when I got in here, we have, we have some very good officers. Um, and a lot of them have a deep heart relationship, a deep, a deep relationship with this village and, and the 
personality of this village and it shows in them um, so you have that I believe that you get those individuals good training you set them good examples you, you um, show them how to proceed a, a good cop can do both um, I think you just need to be able to understand what both roles are I, I'm not so sure they're all that different um, just because someone's a visitor here on a weekend and and you know the locals are staying out of downtown because it's Saturday afternoon and it's the the first warm Saturday um, <laughs> doesn't mean that we should approach those individuals any differently you know the, the fair is fair and the law is the law um, you know I think being seen being out walking around these individuals understand that and and it, I think most people want to respect the police I, I I don't think there's this this large consensus of people who just really really hate the police I think there's a lot of mistrust but most Americans want to respect the police um, so I think you just go forward you keep that hometown feel and you give them good training good supervision and good oversight I think they can function in both worlds does that help I think so Thanks, Dave. Uh, Chrissy <clears throat> <clears throat> Chrissy Cruz, I live on Phillips Street. Um, my question is kind of about, uh, since I've been involved in the policing issues in the community for a while, and several of the things that I hear from people most frequently, what we want in a police chief, is that we want someone that lives here or lives close by, which we can't actually say that somebody has to live here. But I, I know you said that you don't <coughs> intend to move to Yellow Springs, or at least that was what I heard, okay. is that the case? And then another uh, another issue that comes up is that we want a police chief and a police department that's actually listening to what the community has to say and taking our opinions into account as far as how policing is done. And so I was very surprised when I saw your memo when you were asked about looking into ways of cost cutting in the police department and one of the issues that you were asked about was the drug task force. Frequently that's been a uh, subject of discussion. A lot of people in town are not um, wanting our police department to be involved in the drug task force. So these three things, y you recommended that we re remain on the task force even though we don't save money by staying on the task force. So these three things together say to me these are three very important issues to a lot of people in the community and one, you're not going to be living here and two, you recommended that we stay on the task force even though it's what most people have said in forums and discussions that they do not want. So how can you um, reassure me that you are actually listening to what the community has to say and that you do have a good sense for what Yellow Springs wants from its police chief and what other qualities are you bringing to the table, since I don't know exactly what a police chief does all the time, what qualities are you bringing to the table that should be important enough that we can overlook these other three, what I feel are very important issues to the community? Okay. I, I, real, real fast, I got the task force, I got moving. What is the third? Just you said the three. Because we're saying we don't want to be on the, the listening. Task okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, first thing, I n never said I would not move to Yellow Springs. I have a wife that works. She is required, she works in Miamisburg, and she's required to be 30 minutes from her employer. So therefore, Yellow Springs is about 45 minutes from Miamisburg. That presents a bit of a problem. Um, there is a possibility that she, at some point, may stop working or look for a different job. So it's not that I am refusing to move to Yellow Springs, but... Um, if that was a mandate of this job, she and I would have to seriously talk because she also has, has a job and her job is important. As far as the task force, um, number one, we've been in that task force with this staffing ratio for about nine plus years. Um, as I've expressed to council, they hold the purse strings. If we have to make cuts, then I think that is, I would cut that body before I would cut patrol here in Yellow Springs but we've been able to maintain that for a decade my thing is as long as we can maintain it to maintain it um, 
I have this from the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Research in humans and in animals models demonstrates that repeated exposures to drugs of abuse alters brain functions and behavior. Substance abusers experience higher rates of other comorbid mental illness than the general population. Chronic use of some drugs of abuse can cause long-lasting changes in the brain, which may lead to paranoia, depression, aggression, and hallucination. When you look at what a cop does, and when we have our violent encounters, a lot of times those are due to paranoia, depression, aggression, and hallucinations. When you look at the crime that happens on the street, we had a car stolen here in like April, early May. Uh, we get a DNA hit off of it. We go to interview the girl. She's a heroin addict. The car was stolen here. When you get that, that, that air conditioner is taken from a window so somebody takes the copper from it and runs it down to the yard, they're not doing that so they can go out and, and buy tuna fish. They're doing it to support their habit. Um, and my vow and my oath is to uphold the law. The law says those drugs are illegal. If and when the law changes, my job is to uphold the law. My opinion on abortion does not matter. If there's pro-abortion protesters over here and anti-abortion protesters over here and they're both breaking the law, then they both probably need to go to jail. My opinions on these things are neither here nor there. My job is to uphold the law and that is my oath and I will continue to do that. As far as listening to what people have said, my door's been open. There's been plenty of people come in. One or two have done nothing but yell at me, but I'll give them that opportunity to yell at me. Um, I do listen, but police departments aren't there to pander. And, and you know, I'm, I'm not a politician running necessarily for office. My job is to uphold the law, and I will continue to do that. Um, if this council tells me that we need to cut funding and cut a body, we'll be out of the task force. But I believe as long as we can continue it, I believe what it does reduces crime on the street, it tries to keep things in check, and I'm in favor of it. And I know there's statistics that people can argue in the opposite. Um, you know, I mean, you know, we're going to have to agree to disagree, but the bottom line for me, again, comes down to what the law says. And, and, and I take that oath, and I take that oath very seriously. So. Other questions? <clears throat> Excuse me. Other questions? I guess we're coming up close to the. Uh, yes. What time? When's our next interview? You got five minutes. Okay. Because we were in five minutes over. I'm Joe Dowdell. A uh, couple of questions about uh, you've been interim chief for some months now. Two, three. Two, three. Yeah. Uh, so my question really is, in the time you've served thus far, what kinds of things do you see as important going forward? <coughs> what kinds of things do you propose to do to improve your job? And the, and in some directly, directly improve the community. And the other is, could you talk a little bit about what drew you to this job as opposed to another uh, policing job? Thank you. Thanks, um, Let me go to the easy one first here. Um, when, when I retired back in April, um, I figured that if I got back into police work, because I've done a lot of work in the undercover stuff, I, I had supervised the, the drug unit and actually restarted what is now Range Task Force in Montgomery County, organized that, got that going. Um, but that was sort of my forte. I don't have, uh, um, not a learned person, I don't have a lot of degrees. I feel I have a lot of experience, but I don't have the educational things. So I really had never applied for a police job as a chief, did not believe that I would be considered for a police job as a chief had no intention of doing it, and then the interim job opened up. Um, I, you know, once I'm here, I think some of my qualities have been able to uh, be seen, and um, I guess it'll be council and the village manager to get to, to judge whether or not those qualities are, are worthy of the job. Um, 
it wasn't that I so much didn't want to be a chief, but um, I had always been sort of active. I, I worked active beats, the drug unit. I put in lots of hours. I worked midnights. I got up in the middle of my night to go to court. So I didn't get my butt back into school the way I probably should have and didn't prepare myself for it and probably didn't plan for it well enough. I figured that if I got back into law enforcement, it would be over top of another drug unit somewhere. Um, as far as one of the things that I'd like to do and what I think the department sort of needs, as we've Yellow Springs has went through the number of chiefs and interim chiefs and short-term chiefs, um, policy is sort of hit or miss. There's things that have been updated but not completely updated. Um, I'd like to get a complete, thorough general orders manual to include things like what, how to put stuff in the property room. Um, there's been an occasion where we had things in a property room and there's no report attached to it. Well, six months from now, how are we going to remember what that item is and why it's there? That, that's got to stop. There's things like that. Um, I would like to set, because we have certain people in our department who are trainers, we need to get a training schedule set up. There are certain things by law we're mandated to get done. One of those things we're scrambling to get done right now because I can't find record that it was done prior to me getting here in October. Um, so we need to have a training says, schedule set up so that we don't end up, all this should be done September, early October at the latest. Um, I would like to select some outside training courses. There's things I think we're capable of doing but there's things we need to get done. One of those is crisis intervention. It has to do with um, uh, dealing with a lot of people with mental issues. It's a different way of handling things, a little bit less of that red light, green light, a little bit more of talking and handling, and we need to get every officer in this department there. Um, and that's, that's a big task. That's a week-long school. It takes money, it takes time, but it's something we need to do. Um, I'd like to select some administrative training for me. I realize I have some weaknesses. I've not went to a lot of the schools and things that are out there. But there's courses offered. Um, there's actually a free one that did say got sent to me today. State Patrol funds it. Unfortunately, it's like a 10-week school. So, but there are shorter versions. You can take these classes. So there's a lot of that kind of training I'd like to get for me. Um, I'd like to get better coverage than what we have. The crews prior to me getting here have put themselves on 10-hour days, and it works well at times. But on Thursdays, I've got a plethora of people. And on Friday afternoon, a lot of days, I've got Dave Meister here by himself from 5 until 9, and that's ridiculous. So that has to change. Um, I'd like to completely revise our, our dispatch manual. We have a, a manual for our dispatchers. And it's been sort of put together some years ago, and things have been added and taken away. And I've looked through it, and it is, again, sort of haphazard. It needs to be completely rewritten. Um, and then we use some software called New World, which is our reporting system. And um, I'm probably not real sure that I've got an officer who really understands it really well. And number one, I need to understand it a lot better. My officers need to understand it a lot better. Um, so that would be on the agenda and the other thing would be then again to sort of set a tone for the department because I believe leadership comes from the top. Um, somebody asked me after that person was in my room yelling at me for a long time and they're like, why don't you tell them to quit coming by? And I told them because if my troops believe that I have the right to not talk to these people, then they believe they will have the right not to talk to these people. And you can't have that. That's not what we're about. So I need to continue to set that example. I believe I got good people. I believe that if the right amount of, of care, discipline, training, and, and, and coercion is pushed in there, they'll fall into line and we'll have a police department the way you want it. Thank you all. Um, I hope you're all staying um, what we're doing now. Um, I thank Dave Hale for uh, being with us for the past hour and a half. And um, next, uh, the next officer that we're, the next individual that we're considering, Dave Pazinski, will be coming in. We'll have a, a are we taking a break? Or do we, do we need do to take a, a quick break? Or do you want to go? I, I'm fine. I don't want to.
decision? Uh, it's actually um, Patty's, Patty's decision. direct decision. We will obviously be giving her lots of feedback. Um, and you know we'll we'll express our opinions, and she will I I know take them seriously. And um, I hope to think about it uh, over the holidays and let the candidates know, council and the candidates know um, next Friday, um, the day after Christmas is kind of the goal that I've set for myself um, to have a decision made. Do you want to Thanks, make an Pam. announcement about that? Yeah, the, the, there are comment cards outside, so um, please do, um, as Lori just said, you can be anonymous, you can attach your name, whatever you want to do, but just let us know your feedback on, on the two candidates. Um, and um, after we um, have the community, um, you all ask questions of Dave. We have two Daves, so just you have to, you're going to have to use a letter, so I guess an H and a P. Mm -hmm. So um, it is, we decided to make it as confusing as possible. Um, so, um, but just leave your comments and, and or give feedback. Call Patty, Email call me. one of us, you know, however you feel Email. most comfortable communicating. Right. Um, just let us know what you think. Um, and I, I tend not to like to change um, the process, but something I realized um, when we started that, that we should have asked um, Dave Hale to give a, very short um, bio oh, and so I am yeah. I am he actually he, he ended up doing it after somebody was um, good enough to ask that question so I am actually going to ask um, Dave Pazinski to begin by introducing himself and just you know a very short bio of, uh, of your thank experience you. well first of all uh, thank you for having me here uh, luckily you're gonna have a Dave as your chief <laughs> one way or another uh, I have been a police officer for 23 and a half years. I've been a police officer for the city of Xenia, uh, just short, a little south of here. And I have been worked up through the ranks. First of all, I, be, I started off as a, a police officer like all of us do. And uh, four years after being a police officer, I was promoted to DARE officer. And as a DARE officer, I worked with children and uh, I was quite happy as a dare officer. I couldn't believe I was being paid to play with kids. Um, I would tell my wife literally that I can't believe I'm being paid to, to play with kids. After uh, that, I was promoted to sergeant. And I worked as a sergeant for 10 years, a lot of it on nights. Uh, then I uh, was moved to days as I got gained seniority. Um, I've also have a bachelor's uh, in uh, criminal psychology and a um, associates in police science and I also have a um, attended the um, school of police staff and command from uh, uh, Northwestern University after um, being a sergeant for 10 years um, I was lucky enough to be promoted to captain uh, I served as a captain for a proc or excuse me as a patrol captain for approximately 10 months and then I was moved to um, to be the administrative administrative captain in um, uh, I don't think that's your I think Paul's yeah. gonna fix it okay. so maybe pull it. Uh, administrative captain for the city of Xenia police division where that's where I've currently been posted um, and um, I currently handle all the uh, budgeting for the police department I all the purchasing I run the records division at one time I ran the um, uh, communication center which is all the dispatchers but we now have a uh, uh, communications director so that she reports directly now to the police chief uh, I've also um, handled just about anything that has to do with the operations of the police department purchasing etc that's a short bio Thanks, Dave. Um, so now it's uh, your questions. We're ready to hear your questions. Just raise your hand. We'll ask you to come up to the microphone and um, ask your question. Give your name and ask the question. Wow. Um, Sue, we'll s Sue, then Mr. Myers, and then um, Joe. I'm Sue Abendroth, and my question involves uh, what I see as a dual role for our police chief, and 
and that is we have a community <coughs> that is very close knit and we we tend to pull in and think of ourselves as separate and special and we're also very much impacted by Facebook, internet, movies, TV, the, the greater world. We can't really isolate ourselves from the outside, the region, and the things that happen there. But we don't want to, we don't want to do it the same way necessarily. So my question is, how do you see yourself balancing the need to be a small town focused guy and the need to uh, be aware of and work, up, uh, do things about the impact of the outside area that might be good or might be bad for us? Good question, thank you. Uh, first of all, the needs of the community come first, okay, and uh, the needs of the villagers, the council, and the village manager all come first. So uh, we take that, in, uh, I would take that into consideration. Uh, if the village doesn't want something, that's what comes first because obviously you're the taxpayers. You're the people that are first affected, okay? Um, so if you don't want a program, we're not gonna implement that program. If you want policing to be a certain way, that's how we're gonna do policing. So obviously, uh, I'm not going to come in here and tell you this worked in Xenia, this is how we ought to do it. Or this works in LA, this is how we're going to do it. No. This is how Yellow Springs wants to do it, this is how Yellow Springs is going to do it. Okay, so I, I, obviously I'm coming in with ears wide open, eyes wide open. I want to listen to you. Uh, the meeting that was done October 25th, I think it was, where all the input, the community input meeting, I think that ought to continue. It's a wonderful meeting. And that ought to continue. And input from the community should be done. Now, obviously, the police department needs to listen and keep to, uh, its ears open to the nat what's going on nationally so that we stay abreast of what uh, current practices are. Bad ones so we can stay away from the bad practices. Good ones so we adopt the good practices. So we need, to, we, we need to keep ourselves educated as a PD and also to be able to edu educate our community in the good practices. So obviously uh, the village has an influence on how the PD should operate and that way we can help our village. I hope that answered your question. Uh, Mr. Myers? Henry Myers, um, if you became chief, what would your uniform look like that, that you know you would uh, wear most of the time? And what rank would you um, assume for um, official type uh, occasions? Um, obviously, I'd wear the, the uniform <laughs> of the day. Uh, the Yellow Springs Police Department's uniform, which is currently the one in policy, is what I would wear. Um, obviously, if we have a, um, as a chief of police, and with the village manager's approval, the policies would be written, and the uniform of the day and the uniform for special occasions would be dictated by the chief with the approval of the village manager. Now, obviously, if there's uh, special occasions, the chief would wear a, a uniform that would be for special occasion. Obviously in, in Xenia we have a uniform that's for special occasions which is a dress uniform, class A, and we have a class B uniform which is the day-to-day -day operations uniform. Did that answer your question, sir? And rank? Uh, rank is the chief of police, which is usually the eagle colonel or whatever, the, the, the eagle bar, the eagle rank, insignia. Is that right? It, for chief police, it's, a, it's an eagle? That's what it is, yes. <coughs> yes. It's Thanks. an eagle. The sheriff is a star for, for <coughs> it's the military, paramilitary yeah. insignia. But again, it all depends on what the village, if the village w wants, uh, you know, obviously, 
it's whatever the village desires is we can we can tailor it to what the village wants Joe my name is Joe Lewis in your experience on the police force and uh, in Xenia what was the most critical uh, administrative uh, function that you came across and and actual what was the most critical um, police action that you were involved with uh, police actions I've had several um, many that were a bit painful okay um, I don't want to get into gory details or stories that are are um, unpleasant okay um, uh, as a patrol officer and as a patrol sergeant I had to deal with situations that were um, unfortunate uh, people didn't survive um, I during patrol I ran in or rolled up onto a fire where there was an unfortunate a person in the fire and uh, I ran into the house and couldn't save the person um, those are the unfortunate situations babies where the mother rolled over on the uh, baby and the baby passed away suff suffocated so those are the unfortunate things that stay with you the day to day but it teaches it teaches you and it teaches me as a person I learned from those so I could teach other people not to do those things um, as an administrator um, it, I was able to teach officers so that when they go out in the public they could teach um, mothers and they could talk to people hey you know be careful where you have your children be careful where you put the space heaters uh, there's a lot of other incident a lot of other incident accidents um, for example I, um, I was again a, a witness to an accident where a four-year-old was in a car um, the car turned left door open four-year-old fell out um, she was uh, cognizant conscious two minutes later the squad or excuse me squad pulled up squad leaves with the child um, squads lights turn on and they ran code three to the hospital she passed away so that helps you teach people then you know the significance of um, using a car seat uh, you know you can teach people that you know I do have real life experience I've observed these situations I've seen you know so those are the kind of things I can pass along to younger police officers and say look you need to go out in the public and explain this to tell people how these situations these things can affect other people so those are the administrative and real life experiences that I've had S I hope that answers your question someone else um, Robert mr. Harris uh, my name is Robert Harris <clears throat> I'd like to know what are your views on community policing in a small village you came from Xenia which to us is a large town and it's quite a difference in demographics and size well first of all I don't believe in the term community policing okay don't believe in it not in the term oh, okay, okay? Uh, it has a bad taste okay first of all I believe in local let's get together policing I know it's a lot of words okay um, I believe in that we are all part of the problem we have to fix it together okay it can't be just the police it can't be just the council people it can't just be staff it has to be all of us together so I believe in the term of it's the village that needs to get together that's why I liked the meeting we had October 25th everybody getting together you saw a problem with the police division or the department now let's get together you have uh, counts uh, you have commissions and that's what's great about this you have commissions on um, uh, I'm sorry human uh, relations human relations Commission so you have lots of commissions to get together and, and a lot of feedback comes to this obviously the police department would have um, uh, the human relations feedback open door uh, police chiefs uh, police chief walking downtown um, so there's a lot of other programs that we can do together like uh, 
I, a program I like that a friend of mine who's police chief of Belbrook does is he um, has walks with his command staff. He pro, uh, plans, uh, he divides into neighborhoods, and every month he walks, or every other month he walks a neighborhood with his command staff. Okay, and he, he they they advertise it, and he goes, and hopefully people come out and with his command staff talks to the people and says, okay, this is what's going on here. Let's see what's going on. That's part of or that's a part of local policing. Okay, also getting the getting police officers into the schools to walk the schools to shake the hands uh, out into um, uh, playing in recess kickball. Like, so, like I said, I was a dare officer. I loved playing kickball. Foursquare, why not? Having the chief out at the crosswalks, okay? John Grody, who is a friend of mine, he did that. Why not have that? That is all part of local police. Getting out the chief out into the, into the business section, having a cup of coffee at Dino's or whomever, or whatever other restaurants, and having people walk up and say, okay, this is what's going on. I'm a good listener. As I'm, I'm a good talker, sometimes I do get tongue-tied, but I can listen just as well. I bring a good big notepad, I can listen. So that is what local policing is all about. Community policing, the broken windows, pile of theory, and all that stuff, that's a lot of theories for bigger cities and stuff like that. Local policing is getting out and doing things. That's what it is. I hope that answered your question. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Zoe and then Kate. Yes, yes. please. Thanks, Zoe. Hi, uh, Zoe Van Eaton Meister. I just was curious what your thoughts and values and ideas were are about um, the cop cams that are commonly being talked about right now. I think Obama just has said a few things about that this last week. So curious what your thoughts are. I love the idea. I love the idea so much that um, we already applied two months ago or a month and a half ago uh, for a JAG grant. A JAG grant is a justice at, uh, for the advancement of law enforcement grant in, in Xenia. We have, I applied for one for money for the government from the government for body camps for our officers. Okay. Um, uh, they only give about twenty thousand dollars, up to twenty thousand dollars per department, and the department has to match ten percent. Okay, so it's a very good grant. So uh, I support it. I support having every officer because why? It's great. It covers. Inf it gets information. It gets. Uh, it covers the officer. It covers you as a uh, citizen. It let, gives extra eyes to everybody to see what is going on or what has been going on. So it, it, it's, a, it's another tool. So it's a wonderful idea. Kate? Hi, I'm Kate Hamilton. Um, I appreciate you coming to the community forum that we had in October. Uh, one of the themes that was mentioned several times was uh, restorative justice. And I wanted to ask you what that means to you, first of all. Um, it was something that was very important to a lot of different people, and I've heard it mentioned many times since then. Uh, I would like to know, first of all, what it means to you, and second of all, how you think that something like that could be implemented on the policing level. Well, um, first, of, first of all, restorative justice or justice. Police departments or police do not hand out justice and are not supposed to be handing out justice. That is not our function. Um, the police department is part of the um, executive branch. We, okay, we have the legislative branch, which is your council. The police is the enforcement. We enforce the laws that the council or the state <coughs> hand out. Your mayor and uh, Green County um, courts they hand out the justice, okay? So really, when you ask a police department to hand out justice, you are, in effect, telling your police department to be judge, jury, and executioner. So you don't really want that, okay? Now, I am a firm believer that the village 
you know, if you have, uh, you have, uh, I'm a firm believer in officer discretion, okay, that you can't tell an officer you must do this, you must do that, because there are a lot of cases where um, using common sense is very important. Okay, so maybe instead of giving issuing a ticket for speeding, telling the person, "Hey, slow down. There's children in the area here. You have a child." Might be more educational, or um, you know, it, it, situations like that would be much more appropriate. Okay. Now. Again, in situations that are much more serious, that's not appropriate. <coughs> okay? We need to take action. But the police department should never be handing out justice. That's the problem we've had, we've seen in, uh, in whatever agencies where you see pr police brutality. That is what you're seeing is a justice or misjustice ju being handed out. Thanks. Um, Patty, and then. Um, uh, Mr. Randolph, Pastor Randolph. Um, I'm curious to know what your take is on the war on drugs and whether we should participate in the um, drug task force. M my opinion on the war on drugs, is that what you asked me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm being frank here and honest. I think the war on drugs was lost a long time ago. Okay, it's a waste of money. But I'm hired to enforce the laws of the state of Ohio and the city of Xenia, and if I'm hired here, the the um, laws of the village of uh, Yellow Springs. So I'm I'm that's my job, okay. Uh, whether my opinion goes against that or not, okay. Now, obviously, whether we have an officer on the task force, that I would have to consult with the village manager, and she would have to consult with um, council whether or not we have a, a officer on the task force. That decision would have to come in a group setting, okay? Because I really don't know, as a candidate, I don't know what their stance is. To be able to answer. Pastor Randolph? My name is Pastor Randolph, I'm pastor here at First Baptist Church. Let me say, first of all, oh, we know some similar people. Uh, Tim Rue, Chris, Chris Dudes, Kurt Keller. Uh, Chris and, and Tim used to work for me, work with me out at Cedarville University. Oh, okay. I was there for 25 years. But my question That's is, nice <laughs> is um, why Yellow Springs? Why, why I, it's several questions well, that's, actually. That's why, a good why, question. why Yellow Springs? Well, out of all the places, and then I'll just, I'll just give them to you and then let you okay, answer. Let me answer that one first. Why Yellow Springs? I, I originally come from Madison, Wisconsin, okay? Which, if any of you know, is um, very open-minded, very, uh, it's the home of University of Wisconsin. Go Badgers, sorry, but uh, we, we were dealt a sorry. very strong blow the other day. Uh, but uh, uh, it's very open-minded, very, um, culturally open, culturally everything, okay? So 23 and a half years ago when I moved here and I had accepted a job with Xenia, we wanted to live here. My wife actually, when she, my wife is an RN. She went to school and community, uh, Mercy Community, and she lived here in Yellow Springs. So we wanted to live here, we couldn't afford it, okay? So I've always, we've always, and I live down the road on off of uh, Dayton Yellow Springs, right off of Trayvon, just south of Trayvon, a little right there in one of those neighborhoods there. So we couldn't afford it. And it's always been kind of like a gem here. And we come here to eat here and walk our dogs and just have a good time always. And we go to the fair, so it's always been kind of a, like a little gem. So when the opening came around, I thought, hey, why not? And that's the reason. It's a great place. Nelson Mandela said that a leader should always be seen leading, but also should lead from the back. Mm -hmm. My question for you is, what is your style of leadership or your philosophy of leadership? Well, um, my management style, first of all, is I treat my 
my um, people as adults. Okay, I let them. I let them do their job. I don't micromanage. I let them. I give them all the information they need. Okay, to do their jobs appropriately, all the training they need, etc. I now leadership wise, I'm the first one in if need be. Okay, if need be. Um, if we have to go into a dangerous situation, I'm not going to ask someone to do something that I'm not willing to do, obviously. Okay? So whoever I ask to do something, it's because I've already done it myself. Now, as a manager, obviously I'm not going to be able to jump into every, every door that needs to be jumped into because that's why I have officers too. Okay? So, 23 and a half years, I can, I've said, I can say I've done it all, okay? So again, I'll be leading, and if need be, I'll do it, but that's why I have younger officers to do it too. Okay. This is a two for one, and I'm gonna take my seat. Go for it, <laughs> go for it. Uh, that is on the, the minority hiring here mm -hmm. in Yellow Springs is one part of the question, and in light of what we've seen across the country, not so much because you know officer wants to go home at the end of the day mm -hmm. okay safely mm -hmm. and I understand that but my question also in regarding uh, minority hiring is also related to training programs so that officers uh, when they arrive on the scene you know when I used to teach uh, the officers out of Cedarville you know, sometimes we would say the best ticket to write is the one that you don't write mm -hmm. and so what is your idea about you know about training your your uh, mindset towards that, getting more uh, training in here to this community and on minority hiring. Okay. And then thank you. Let's, Thanks, let's, tackle, Thanks. let's tackle minority hiring first. It's been a, it's a problem. Uh, I'm a, I'm half, I'm half Latino. My mom's Colombian and I lived in Colombia, South America for over eight years. I'm fluent in Spanish. I'm one, and you would never guess it with my last name, okay? <laughs> Nobody ever says, I, I've actually had to show um, my Colombian passport, okay? To show that I am half Colombian. And uh, when I told my chief that I was putting in for here, and he says, my gosh, I'm losing one of my minor minorities, because I am considered a minority. <laughs> and, but hiring minorities has been the most, the hardest thing we've had to do in Xenia. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with Alonzo Wilson, one of our officers in Xenia. Um, he's close to retirement. And his nephew, David Wilson, he's being courted by um, the, um, the feds. Why is it so difficult? And especially in the African American community. Very simple. Nobody wants to be a cop. Nobody wants to be labeled, and excuse my language here, a snitch, okay? Because that's what we, we are looked at, or uh, African Americans, unfortunately, look at, and Alonzo's told me that, because I've asked him, what can we do? What can we do? And I've asked him, I had, uh, two weeks ago, I asked him, what can we do? He says, it's, it's, it's a no-win situation. Now, the only offer more money, villages and cities can't offer more money because the budgets are so tight as it is. Training for uh, to bring in minorities? Well, I have to train then the officers too because I got to train everybody equally because I have to keep everybody trained equally. Again, cost. But, and unfortunately, the media is not helping. Because I can tell you, the Ferguson thing, the uh, New York thing, the Cleveland thing, that's, that is a small group of police officers. It's not everybody. It's not everybody. I can tell you that. Xenia, we're not like that. I would cut, I would cut off both my arms before, I, uh, that, uh, before somebody in Xenia would do that to any minority. But the perception is that we are. So the, 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 the news media is not helping to recruit minorities because of the, the, the perception that we are all 
racists. We're not. But I can't beat I can't beat the media. I can't offer I can't offer a better salary. I can't beat the media. I can't beat education. So it has to come from the person themselves wanting to. I, I was with three young men at a color day at mm -hmm. elementary school. Four young men, mm -hmm. first grade, and three of them said they wanted to become police officers. So keep well, that's that's why I come with the idea of let's get the officers in the school shaking hands so that they lose the fear of the officer, the uniform, um, et cetera, because it's great. Like I said, other than playing kickball and all that, the kids coming up to you and, and just saying, hey, officer, how you doing? It's, it's a good feeling. It is a really good <coughs> feeling. So getting the officers in the schools, um, another idea I, I would really like to have is, have is another one that I'm stealing a lot of the ideas that he, and I told him I was going to do this if I got the job, was having a call load permitting. It's having uh, cruisers following uh, school buses randomly, just so that school buses and kids see that, that the officers are there and that they're friends, that we're not the bad guys. So. Hopefully that answered your that answered your first one. What was your second one again? Minority recruiting. Uh, training. 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 Education is high. As like I said, I have a bachelor's. I have an associate's, and I also have. I've gone to uh, Northwestern School of uh, Police Staff and Command. I've gone to so many uh, training classes. We are big into training in Xenia. It's uh, our budget in, in Xenia for training is roughly about sixteen thousand a year. We send everybody there to as many schools as you can. We have uh, we train a lot in um, in uh, cultural sensitivity. We train a lot in uh, verbal judo, um, which verbal judo is how to. You're familiar with it. For those of you who are not, is to how to deflect uh, and to um, de-escalate uh, um, critical incidences with use of words and uh, calming words, etc. Um, critical incident training uh, through um, the um, uh, uh, oh, like I lost my train of thought there. There's a critical incident training also to help uh, mentally ill, and uh, we tra we've sent all, uh, just about all our officers through critical incident training. So it's uh, it's very important training, and I come from that department. It's very important, and uh, budget. Budget. Um, if the budget here, if I'm allowed to, I plan to send people to training. Okay. Um, we have about five minutes. Um, I would probably take one or two more questions. Any other questions, Carol? questions I'm not sure yet but uh, since you are from our area here in the Green County and everything I'm sure you're very aware of the unfortunate situation that has recently happened here in Yellow Springs and I realize that different police departments <coughs> probably have different rules and regulations and codes I'm not sure about that but giving that possibility um, can you uh, speak on how you might have handled that situation uh, if you had been chief here at the time? Well, um, that's a very difficult situation to analyze, okay? And putting my shoes in, or putting my feet into the chief shoes that were there at that time because um, I understand the chief wasn't here at that time, if I remember correctly, or wasn't present. Which, which incidents oh, are? Sorry. The, the camera. Funny. The camera, oh, the camera. The very recent. Um, yeah. I preferred, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I'm going to, I don't want to sound rude, but I prefer not to comment on that one since he is another um, candidate. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I don't feel, I don't have the knowledge or of the inside knowledge to comment on his, him and I don't want him, I don't want to, 
I want to have the respect. I want to respect him okay. and, and the village's I decision. I am just curious though, do you all have the same set of rules like the as No, as you know, each department each has different department rules. Has different yes. rules for different conduct. incidents and mm -hmm. conducts that happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other thing I did want to mention, I love the idea of, that you have and uh, about the children um, here and making sure that the police are a part of that. Um, generally we do that and do it well. I've heard recently that that may not be have been done uh, and maybe because the uh, these numbers are down do they still go to the schools and help the children you mean during, when they're go coming in the morning and leaving if there's an officer available they do okay because I think so. there is where a lot of it should start mm -hmm. and then the students the children become familiar with the police and they begin to respect <coughs> them and feel much more comfortable obviously so uh, we, we would have hopefully that would continue and since you seem to be a supporter of that I'm sure it would that's it thank you thank you very much uh, anyone else we have about two minutes okay we'll s end early we all we're going to be going into executive session so um, well it'll take us a while but I w actually, I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session for the purpose of personnel hiring. Let me s thank you all for being here. Answer, put put comments in the comment cards in the box. Call Patty. Email. Call one of us. Email Patty. Anything you have to say about this evening, um, and please stick around at seven o'clock. Um, there will be. Will there be cookies? There are cookies. There will be there cookies, cookies, and, and, and both and, uh, candidates and will be here to talk in a more uh, casual way. So please join us and have your yes, dessert. Please. Thank you for Thank being you. here. Thank you. Thank you. So we appreciate good questions. I'll make a motion to move into executive session.